Welcome to the Consummate Athlete Podcast, where we explore what it means to be a well-rounded, happy, goal-crushing athlete. Every week, myself, sports journalist Molly Herford, and cycling coach and kinesiologist Peter Glassford interview experts and chat through all of your training questions. We're excited to have you along for the ride. Hello, hello. Welcome back to the Consummate Athlete Podcast. Peter, how's it going? It's going well. I'm wearing the same shirt as the last one, and I'm quite self-conscious about it. I was just telling you that I have some sort of trauma, I guess, about, I don't know if kids made fun of me for wearing the same clothes, but here we are. Well, conveniently, the uh, video is cutting off your hair, so you don't have to get self-conscious about that. <laughs> oh, you don't have to worry about your clothes glassing with hair like that. <laughs> All right. Enough funny business. Oh, oh, God, it is. It's wild. Okay. It is wild. That's for the YouTube listeners. Okay, it's back in line here. Speaking of which, if you're listening to this on a podcast, we are now also on YouTube, which is very exciting. Uh, definitely head over there. Check it out if you want to see what we're wearing in any given episode. Yeah. Otherwise, there's really not much the to say. highlight in me maybe moving my hands once or twice but i don't know do some i guess we could put up like slides or something i don't know what they would say but... you can put up slides i'm not doing that okay. well yeah some subtitles or something oh boy well there are subtitles so oh. actually anyone who's asked about uh getting the show on uh if we have oh, transcriptions yeah. yeah you can go to our youtube to read the podcast right um is there a whole transcript there is a whole transcript that you can pull out uh well i guess i can put it on our website I think there might be now we, there's probably people screaming at us but i think you might actually be able to grab all the words all at once i'm not sure oh like in yeah, youtube i should man. look into that okay well anyway it checks out on youtube if you want to read instead of listen like read along though. yeah yeah uh, at least like if you're if you're least. sitting at work and you can't have audio going for some reason you can still be watching this sure sure what did we read it was like youtube or not youtube on on like netflix wasn't it a super high percentage of people use uh, leave closed captioning on yeah, yeah. Closed captioning the subtitles uh, well we certainly do because everyone in my family talks a lot while we try to watch tv but just then... they were saying that part of the reason it's not just you it, it's that actually the the sound balancing or, or that isn't as good as it once was oh it's so bad yeah yeah i don't know if i buy that it seems odd that that would be the thing but that's oh, what no. people said i never have trouble re like hearing everything fraser is saying in fraser <laughs> um but any new shows it's somehow the music is really loud the like uh the if it's an action movie all of the action is really loud but somehow you just you can't hear a word that the rock is saying and you know really important dialogue happening there well related to my hair it's it might be that we're getting old so there you go it's true so we have three it's questions true. today um we do uh before we get into them first uh just a quick reminder we do have a lot of people going in for three month training plans custom made for you high-end and VIP exclusive. Um, That's right. I mean, this is a unique product. You know, I'm sure other people do similar, but I, I don't think they do it quite as well if I do say so myself. But this is, you know, a training plan that you're going to fill out an intake form as if you were going to the doctor or something like that. I'm not a doctor, but I do play one on TV sometimes. And I, I build a plan custom to your schedule, your gear, the equipment you want. If you never want to ride inside, if you only want to ride inside, you know, if, if you can't train on Sundays, if you whatever, right, like you the, the, we build a plan for that and the races, the goals you have. Uh, and that's really the beauty of this made for you three month plan. So I love this particularly, uh, you know, for anyone, but especially people who are really busy or have really um, weird schedules. I find you know, any training plan you buy that's pre-made is really built with a Monday to Friday, nine to five in mind. Uh, but we know most people aren't living like that anymore necessarily. Or, you know, you have a super busy day on Wednesday or on, you know, Thursday or Friday or whatever. Like you're not 19. So the plan that was built for a 19 year old doesn't really apply if you're 50. You know, it's, 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 there's a lot of variables there. You know, you know, a lot of people want to ride two different styles of bike or their long ride. They like to do it on a certain day. So yeah, there's, there's lots of variability and that's, you know, we don't want to have to force you into this other, uh, you know, hole, square pair, round hole, whatever it is. Well, or, you know, conversely, you buy the premium training plan and then you just shift it all over the place and like move everything around. So it's, you're not even really following the plan because it's not really about necessarily doing all of the workouts in a given week. And this is a mistake that I always used to make. Do you remember my like triathlon bingo that I basically used to play? Right. It was very odd, but I'd have like a list of all the workouts that I had on the schedule for the week, but rather than following the plan, I would just 
you look at what I had during any given day, what I felt like doing and just do, you know, X, Y, Z off the training plan until I had completed all of them, which right. led to some really busy Sundays. And, and it probably isn't the worst thing. The, 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 the catch with it is probably that you have to finish all of them. Well, you could probably select, you know, based on what you think you do a good job on, or maybe there'd be a few good rules in there. You know, you don't do all your intensity, like back to back to back and number of works. So it's in a day, but but yeah. the problem is you end up do you you end up not doing the proper like rest recovery like intervals when you're the most sure. rested like any of that um versus you know if i had just gone you know if you had looked at it and kind of like built it out around my actual preferences and schedule uh, i was also just a nightmare to coach back then so like right. apologies this, to any coach really I had. Gone yeah. in a different direction but that's the idea is that we fit it ideally so that there's minimal adjustment and you don't have to do a lot of extra thinking and maneuvering. You can just sort of focus on the actual, the, the training. Exactly. So you can find more on that over at consummateathlete.com. We'll put a link in the show notes to it as well. Um, yeah, it's, I think it's well worth checking out, especially if you're looking for a little bit of direction uh, for your upcoming races, whether they're in three months or six months or nine months or whatever. Uh, anyway, anything else new? No, I was going to ask you, you know, we're doing these Q&As maybe a little more frequently in 2024. That's sort of the feedback we got was people like the Q&A. So maybe build upon those a little bit. Still some interviews. We'll do some great interviews. We'll have some good people back. We had a lot of really great ones, I thought, in 2023. Oh, yeah. Uh, we just did a repost there around the holidays with Stacey Sims, which everyone seemed really psyched on again. That was our, our one of our most popular episodes from last year, the 2023. And like, let's be honest, you almost peed your pants when we got Kelly and Juliet Sturette on the That's podcast. True. Although this year. funny story, Molly was just one night was like, I have to go call someone. And I was like, what is it? It's 7 p.m. What are you doing? We don't usually do a lot after 5 p.m. She's like, I have to call Kelly Sturette. I did. It was great. And this was for another, it wasn't for the podcast, but for an interview for an article and they're on the West coast. So yeah, she just sort of walked away and just phoned her buddy Kelly. And I was just sitting in the base or in the in downstairs, just sort of like beside myself that this was happening. It was great. And that article will actually be in Canadian running magazine. I think next month, uh, sort of all about, can you balance longevity and performance and running? And Kelly was great for that. Yeah. Uh, but if you missed that episode, definitely go back and read it. Is there any other big news topics that you've written about this week? Well, I was actually just talking about this on another podcast I was on. I was on my friend Carrie's Plucky Not Perfection podcast, and she asked me if I had a word of the year. And actually, I happened to have been writing that article that day. Uh, so, uh, yeah, a couple of weeks ago, I posted my word of the year. It's something I've been doing for quite a few years now. I mean, it's it's very kind of zeitgeisty, I guess, now to do that every year. But I feel like I was doing it before it was cool. Uh, but I think you read something. Oh, I definitely read it somewhere, but it, when it was still like a like lesser known I remember thing. You thought this. But in any case, it's what, been what a was, few years. So you wrote this article. Was there a new twist on the word of the year, or well, you just a new, pick one? I have a new word of the year. Okay, what's this year? Well, this year it's this year. The twist, I guess, is that it's the it's the word that I was going to choose last year, but at the last second, I changed my word. I know. Uh, so it was going to be strong last year in 2023. And at the last second, I changed it to intentional, which felt very vibey at the time. Very like, uh, you know, I was reading a lot of like well-being and meditation and, you know, living the soft life. Uh, I realized very quickly that's not for me. Okay. I don't know who I don't know who I thought I was. Um, and clearly strong just kept coming up and up and up. Given I started Strong Girl Publishing, I published my book, The Strong Girl. Um you know, obviously strength training is like always a part of my stuff, but it was a big year for it. And that was my prediction. Yeah, it was. So yeah. this year we are just leaning in. We are just owning strong. Oh, so you're going with last I'm going year's. back. I'm going back. I'm going to the word that I abandoned last year. Well, I guess what was that? You go with like your gut instinct and things. Well, that go. was it. So I learned that in 2023. You go with your gut. I learned that you should go with your gut. And now, I just read something to the, the alternative of that is that it's actually a horrible idea to go by your gut. Yeah. Who said that? I don't know. I need to read more about it. But I was like, okay, this makes sense. You need to be careful. I mean, I agree. And, you know, I think that's why at the time intentional seemed good. But looking back, I realized it was, I'm just so impressionable. Okay. Like I, yeah, I was a hundred percent with your gut then. Well, the funny, th yeah, <laughs> careful with your gut. Cause my gut was like, oh, intentional makes sense. My gut goes in a lot of different directions is really the key here. Right. Okay. Yeah. But it was funny. The embarrassing thing is so the the reason I picked intentional was uh, a blogger that I read all the time. And then she put out a newsletter in February of last year that was like, 
uh, you know, responses from her community on Instagram. And it was like 75% of people's word of the year was intentional. And I was like, oh my God, I just got unconsciously influenced into this word of the year. So I never really loved the feeling. Um, and yeah, clearly at February is when I came up with the idea for Strong Girl Publishing and by okay. May it existed. So there you have it. So is this the article you're telling me about? Yeah. Okay. yeah. So you can check that out over on consummateathlete.com as well. Oh, it was for us. Okay. It was for us. Oh, but you got interviewed about it. Okay. I'm yeah. with you. Yeah. Lots of things. Okay. Okay. Let's get into the questions. Yep. We got three where we have three today. We have three. Uh, yeah. So first one up is, I actually really like this one, is what do you do when you run out of weight? So in particular, this is about weighted carries. They don't have enough weight for them. How do you progress with that? I think it's a great question. I think it's very common for cyclists. I think after pandemic, you know, a lot of people got into strength and were doing it at home, you know, or they were already into strength and they were doing it at home. And, you know, you maybe got the 20 pound dumbbells or the five pound dumbbells or whatever the weight your dumbbell is. And then you're trying to do a new exercise. You know, we're really big on the weighted carries. So you just basically pick up some weight and you walk across the room. Now the catch is it needs to be quite heavy. Uh, you know, I always say it's heavier than your squat. It's not as heavy as your as a full deadlift, which may not mean anything to some people if you're not doing heavy stuff. But if this is like the weights that you do overhead press with or upper body exercises with, it, it's it's obviously not the heaviest weight you can pick up and, and it's not going to challenge your grip and your breathing. What you want with a, a farmer's carry is that essentially you're going to drop it. Like you, you know, you almost can't hold on to it any longer. We're building that valuable grip strength and the posture. Um, so the question is, what do you do? So you, you can, so that makes it hard to do like the cheesy health magazine version of like, well, use a can or use like a gallon jug or something. Cause it's just not going to be enough. Right. So, you know, you, you don't have it. So say you let's stick with the weighted carry idea. So there's a few options. There's stuff around home. So here we're at Molly's parents' house. We're at the in-laws and Molly's dad is a landscaper. So he has like bags of sand. So yesterday I was doing weighted carry. We have a 52 pound dumbbell just one that we've brought with us the adjustable ones and then there's this bag of sand that i think was like a 30 pound bag of sand so i would get it I, I had them up raised up so i didn't have to bend over completely to get them i would put them the bag on my shoulder you can choose how you support it and balance it around and then i would grab the 52 pound dumbbell and then carry that and i was like breathing was a challenge because now you have a thing on your rib cage and you're sort of weighting you and it also was like getting you know heavier uh, to support all this. And well, and I love that because it, it really challenges you in a lot of unique ways. And actually I was just reading, uh, Michael Easter's the comfort crisis, fantastic book, highly recommend. And he does talk a lot about when we lift weights in the gym, often it's machines that hold the weight in place for us. And even free weights, you're using an exact poundage, mm -hmm. uh, which, you know, is great if you're trying to progress and like gauge your, you know, write it down in your Excel spreadsheet or whatever. Uh, but it's, it's not really in the wild, right? Your groceries are not going to weigh 25 pounds. They're going to weigh, you know, whatever they're going to weigh. Well, are the loads you're resisting when you fall off your bike or try and hold on to your yeah. bike or, you know, running, you have to stumble sideways and maybe put your hand into a tree, right? You're, you're having to resist these loads and push or pull or whatever you're doing. So you bring up a, a great point that, so I said you could use something around the house. You know, what else do you have that's heavy? Cinder blocks, rocks, whatever. Careful. Load them into yeah. a suitcase. You need to be careful that you don't bend over and pick some of these irregular loads up oh, straight off the ground. I would raise a lot of these up, especially for something like a weighted carry. Um, but it, I mean, squatting would be similar. We have a squat rack so that you don't have to pick it up generally off the floor as the weights get more challenging. So I said that I said with weighted carries and, and there's a my fitness pal article uh if you google everyone should do more carries it's still up um and we'll link it in the show notes uh but it has lots of the variations of the carry so I was doing one where I had something on my shoulder so let's say you you have two 20 pound weights if you put say say your shoulders are in good shape and you don't have any concerns putting stuff overhead if you just put both your arms overhead with those two 20 pounds your arms are straight over your head and you're walking carefully across the room or the gym or wherever you are that's going to get a lot more challenging than just holding on to the 20 pounds at your feet oh i love that i was the I, there's a variation that you know you could do one up and one down and then the down one could have a bit more weight in it but then the the up one doesn't have to have a lot of weight if you put a weight up above your head it's a you, you can't put quite as much as you can hold in your hand um, but your arms up, so your shoulders get tired very quickly. 
Uh, so that would be just the variations of all the, the carries would be where I would go with that. And then you, sorry, a uh, long way around here to get to, you don't need to have the same weight side to side. So you could go to suitcase carry as one of the variations, all the weight on one side, like a suitcase, or, you know, you load up like a, a bag or something, or maybe you're like us, you have a 52.5 pound on one side, and then all you have otherwise is a 10. Well, right. Then put the 10 in your other hand and maybe put it overhead or or not, right? But that's 60 pounds and, and that's more than 52 that you've been doing. And, and you walk across the room and yes, one side is a little heavier, switch it halfway down or switch it the other set. Uh, and, and that's great. Love it. Love it. Um, and anything else, like, I mean, that was carries. Um, but if you, you know, if you're one of the people that had the 10 pound weights, any tips for well for the really light stuff I, I think it's not a big deal to like really carefully fasten stuff together now i didn't tell you to do this if it drops on your head or something like that so be smart not a it. doctor but there are some pretty industrial if you go to home depot or something you can get like the they're like tie downs that are like rubberized things to tie cables and stuff together and they're quite strong but if you got a really industrial sized zip tie or uh, something just, you, you want to really tie them together, but some of these smaller weights, you could hold two in your hand, probably. You've even done, I had ankle weights or mm -hmm. little tiny, like one pound, like hand weights and you actually, they Velcro and you Velcro them onto weights. And, and for some of us, you know, the jump from five to 10 to 20 on an upper body might actually be a lot, uh, you know, depending on where you are. So indeed some of these like little, if you do have ankle weights or something like that, you can actually just put them, you know, safely, you can fasten them to your weight probably without it, you know, there's really very little risk with those. Uh, so, so, so that would be the other thing. And you could maybe find other stuff around the house. Again, careful, but that's, that's the other thing. With carries, you know, and, and probably some other stuff, rows, you could certainly use like a bag and, and put a few dumbbells in there. If you had like a whole assortment of one pound weights, you put them in a duffel bag, suddenly it's a 20 pound duffel bag. You know, you might break the strap eventually doing rows or or carrying it across the room, but that's a suitcase carry. Like make your suitcase, you know, what's the limit to get on the airplane? 50 pounds? Yeah, something to that yeah. effect. So find a 50 pound suitcase, right? Yeah, fill fill it up with all the stuff you took last time you did a trip. Yeah, right. Yeah. Try to pack for a weekend and see how much it weighs. Um, and I mean, also just scope Facebook Marketplace, all of those, because I think a lot of people are, in fact, selling a lot of their pandemic gym purchases. That's got wild. But yeah, if you if you watch and just be patient, you know, don't be in a rush to get it today. But yeah, you should be able to find some of these heavier weights, the kettlebells, uh, the, the adjustable dumbbells, different things, doorway pull-up bars we love. Yes, yep. cannot recommend those enough. Worth the weight in gold. Uh, so hopefully that helps. Uh, when in doubt, you know, there's other ways to make stuff harder. I guess you would have range of motion. So go deeper, you know, if you're not using full range of motion for a squat or something like that, um, even push-ups, you know, you can raise your hands up and then go a little deeper again, gradually, because this is going to cause more soreness. Um, but that would be the other thing to check lunges. You can go through more range of motion than most people use again, carefully, uh, over time. And certainly like any position that like challenges balance as well as lifting. So this is where your Romanian deadlifts come in instead of just regular sure. deadlifts. Sure. Yeah. And you could, I mean, again, if, if all you have is all you have, then for sure you would go to like a one leg variation of the thing. So like you say, a, a one leg Romanian deadlift or a lunge or a one leg squat or something like that. And, and that's, that's certainly a way to do it. Yeah. I think a lot of people just kind of default to, oh, the heavier weight is the only change I can make versus even just, yeah, doing different exercises with the weights that you have. Yeah, definitely. And if you haven't mixed it up in a while, like definitely mix it up and then go more unilateral or one leg, one arm, that sort of thing. Uh, Cause that can often open up a whole world of, of stuff you haven't uh, tried and do that for a while. The, the last thing would be just, I see a lot of, you know, the program says three sets of eight. And so people will only do eight, but it is completely fine to just go till it's hard if, if the weight you have and it's like it's 20 or it's 12 or it's 30 that's sort of where you're at until you get more stuff or you figure out how to make it harder so that's that's fine and, and then note that in your book that you did overhead press for 20 reps and then the homework for the next what you know workout or the next week or the next block is, is to figure out how am i going to drop this back down to eight or whatever the next goal is uh, but you definitely don't need to stop always, you know, just for the sake of the workout. You sort of want to think like, did this get hard at the end? You know, I've done this workout for the last three weeks. And every time I do three by eight, well, 
if it was eight to 12, do 12. And then if you've done 12, the last time, well, this is the sign to progress it, right? So somehow. Mm -hmm. Love it. Okay. Next question. Should I be fueling with sugar powder, AKA carbs on all rides? Should they be pure carb fueling? So like a tailwind for low intensity workouts or looking for something with some other macros for the low and slow rides? I feel fine on carbs, just curious. And I think this was like sort of in the base off season, you know, where we okay. are now, right? Where it's not necessarily like during the race season. Mm -hmm. So I, I think a smart thing to ask, you know, mm -hmm. when and how much and, and whatever. And it's, you know, as always, it depends a bit on the person and what they're trying to do. Uh, what do you do? Uh, I mean, I am a straight carbs all the time person. Uh, so you use Tailwind. I use Tailwind. Um, Primarily, and I've, we've been using maple syrup. Yeah, so I use, like a gel flask. Yeah, but I don't really, especially on the run, I definitely don't really mess with much else beyond that. The occasional flat coke during a race, or like, mm -hmm. you know, during like a super long one, mm -hmm. I might have had like Chicken a cookie soup. or a, yeah, a sip of soup. But that was, I mean, that's a hundred mile or like right. the yeah, fifty mile or whatever I did in October. That was straight tailwind. So rarely the do, time. even when you're training, you don't do bars or. No, bananas, no, but, sandwiches. But okay, here's the caveat though. Definitely not sandwiches. That's weird. You don't uh, got a hoagie. Don't got a hoagie. Uh, okay, so the caveat here is I'm a runner with a very sensitive gut. Like I have a lot of like gut distress when I run if I'm not careful. Mm -hmm. Even if I am careful, I have gut distress on the run. So I don't add extra stuff to my fueling. Uh, I also find it's very hard to chew while you run. Uh, I just don't find it enjoyable. That said, on the bike, I'm definitely a lot laxer with what I eat. So when, you know, when we were in Spain coaching training camps, they had these crepe things that were stuffed with, with like a Nutella type filling. And I housed those. They were on, amazing. They, they came were so in the, good. They were like, they were sticks. Uh, sticks is the wrong word. What, what did they look like? What other food comes? It was come? a crepe. Uh, it, it reminds me almost like a hot rod, but it was bigger than a hot rod. But that's please stop making that gesture on video. Sorry. Yeah, and I say in hot rod. Yeah. <laughs> Apologies uh, to anyone watching on YouTube. We're gonna get banned. So there you go. You can imagine, I guess. But it was cylindrical, and and it, but it fit in a jersey pocket, and was delicious. Yeah. But it was also just super cheap i think it was like two euros for 10 sure. of them they were just crappy like grocery store things sort of akin to it's not did not taste anything like but akin to like riding with fig newtons or something sure. which also i will do on rides so i'll add something that would maybe have a bit more fat in it a bit more fiber a little and bit of maybe, protein maybe might have stopped at a few coffee shops for pastries sure so the fat content, I would say, is probably higher when I ride, but not purposefully. And that example, though, you know, you're sort of on a training camp where you're doing a ton. So your body, you know, you sort of want to make sure that there's a ton of fuel there, enough fuel at least, uh, to, for your body to keep adapting and not bonking. So there uh, you were probably doing a bit of sugar powder or gels and then some of these solids to sort of augment it, get you through a long day. Mm -hmm. And I think that's that's important. Now, the one we're not looking at is the cyclist then who's doing sort of their off season training. They're mostly maybe on the indoor trainer, maybe, you know, they're doing a good balance. So on the weekends, they're trying to get outside. They're maybe doing like some fat bike rides or cross country skiing. So the question to me then is, you know, do you use sugar every single ride? You put tailwind in the bottle, you go down, you do your hour, you put tailwind in your bottle, you go and do your cross country skiing. All right, look, we are not made of money. We are not doing that. <laughs> I'm actually like, I'm furious anytime you leave on a ride and I see the tailwind out because I'm like, that is expensive. Send it, I guess. I know. So I, I think what I would do is I, I, especially if I'm on the trainer, I'm big on fruit, you know, orange slices. This could be like, I've seen people do sandwiches and you're probably not that far from your kitchen. So I say, you know, take your bathroom, take a break at an hour, go for bathroom, grab an orange, grab a banana, grab a sandwich, leftover pizza. I was more making a gut distress if, joke. If, if the intensity isn't high, this is, you know, general rules of fueling. And this is across the, the year. This I don't think is specific to the base phase, but if the intensity is low, you can probably, as Molly said, she did a hundred miles. She was eating soup. There was people having brisket during that thing. Like the people have all sorts of stuff. Bacon. To be clear, no one won on brisket. But they they did it. Um, so you know, when you're when it's not super intense, you probably don't need the sugar powder unless we're in that big base camp situation where you're really pushing the limits of, you know, you're going really long. There's maybe 
times where you're climbing the mountain and it gets a little more intense and you just need to try and keep the food in to keep up with it. You're probably not going to be able to, but you do the best you can. So you're doing sugar powder and some solids in that camp. When we're at home, I think you're thinking, you know, maybe for that Zwift race on Tuesday, the high intervals you do on the Tuesday and the Saturday, maybe those have the sugar powder, maybe a gel if you want, or maple syrup or honey or whatever you're into, the sugar. And then the other days, I think you're probably just eating before and after if it's about an hour or, or you know, maybe up to 90 minutes. And then you could have, again, fruit sandwich bar would be more on these endurance days and you know i really feel like we've kind of forgotten about the old like scratch labs like homemade rice bar recipes mm -hmm. where it was like the sushi rice with, yeah, whether it was the savory a little bit of soy sauce a little bit of scrambled egg maybe a little bit of bacon or the sweeter ones with more of a jam and peanut butter kind of situation or even just like coconut flakes chocolate chips uh, definitely, I think we can definitely get back to that, especially on the longer, slower rides. And it's way more filling. I think so. It, it's also not that hard to do. It maybe takes a little bit of time investment, uh, you know, on the Sunday. But once you figure it out, people get very quick at it. Uh, for oh my young gosh. athletes, I think this is very important that they they practice making them and figure it out. Because so as I said, it, it gets very expensive. Uh, but these are very customizable, you know, more sugary, more savory. So maybe in the base phase, there's a little more savory to it, uh, but just really good cost effective. They go down, you know, it seemed like everyone seemed to tolerate them mm -hmm. pretty well when we've been on camp. So that's good. Uh, maybe I'll even put, uh, the rice, uh, one of the, but you, the rice cakes from Alan Lim and, and scratch fuel, but, uh, that book, what is that book called? Uh, feed zone Feed portables. Uh, fantastic really book. good. Yeah. Great book. Uh, I yeah, but I'll put, I think there's videos where they need yeah. the stuff. So now cool. I think my caveat to your point about the, the fruit on the trainer and stuff is definitely if you're doing a long ride outside, please, for the love of God, do not just try to fuel your entire like six hour oh, ride yeah. on one banana <laughs> and like two fingerling potatoes that you have in foil. Oh, potatoes is a good one too, though. Yes and no. <laughs> I think potatoes are this like gateway to not eating enough. Uh, ditto the packs of um, baby food that got really trendy a couple of years ago, where if you look at them, they're 50 calories. They're too big. They're too big. They're 50 calories. They're tons of fiber, which like, yay, if you like fiber, but like, boo, if you're running or riding. I don't know um, if it's that bad, but there's probably some there for sure. But yeah, the, a lot of stuff that, you know, if we're trying to get something every hour or again, it's 200 plus calories an hour or however you want to bring it down, 40, 50 grams plus an hour, you know, are we going up to the 90, 120 grams an hour, which is 400, 500 calories an hour? It's a lot of potatoes. For most of us, you know, it's not a lot. And I think our general rule of thumb of like, something every hour if it's only an hour just have breakfast and lunch you know or lunch and dinner or whatever uh is is probably fine but i think your point is good that like if if we're just having like a 40 calorie snack and it's a three four hour ride then that's not something every hour and it's certainly not getting close to that 200 calories you know or, or i call it a cliff bar an hour yeah so i do think that's if you're really struggling to take in enough real food whole food whatever you want to call it uh, in that ride, then yes, sugar powders are great. Like if it's that or you're not eating enough, stick with the sugar powders until you can get to the point where you are eating enough, especially because on the bike, what we didn't really touch on is not everyone is great at eating on the bike. And I don't just mean like your gut doesn't take it. I mean, you're physically not as good at like reaching into your pocket and grabbing the bar. Sure. Especially when you get a winter coat on and you're riding. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yep, or you're on rollers at home or yeah there's a whole sort of reasons or, or all sorts of reasons that people end up under fueling and so it is it's something that i think i've come back around on the last couple of years that yeah probably a lot you know that we've we've really we started buying maple syrup and gallon jugs and, and this sort of stuff and, and and for sure it worries me a bit on the dental hygiene side of things but you know it's you know you maybe brush your teeth a little more and make sure you're rinsing with uh, water but yeah it's one of those things. there's trade-offs with everything i guess exactly Okay, well, on the note of training camps, we did kind of mention it there as we were talking about fueling, uh, but I love this question. Heading to a week-long training camp somewhere warm next month, solo, just any any sort of tips? Um, I think this is something that a lot of people run into, right? They're either heading with friends to, you know, on, we have a ton of Ontario friends that head to South Carolina, North Carolina, Florida, California, uh, anywhere basically where there isn't snow and you can ride outside uh, for, you know, a week, 10 days, usually February, March. Um, 
And both the getting like the prep ahead of time and the actual what to do when you're there is tricky. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so where the, would you the, go? With the this? other note this person said is, you know, they're they're very flexible to do. They're not on like a camp, you know, a formal camp or like a tour or anything. Um, a lot of clients will go on more of an organized camp, which you know I think then you're in it, right? You just I always say like, tell me what you did, you know, no way you go. Right. But I think a lot of people end up on these semi-organized camps where it's you're going with a few of your training buddies or with your club and you can kind of do your own thing or get swept along with what everyone else is doing. Mm -hmm. So you're sort of in a really weird place. Sure. Um, so, I mean, let's start, as you said, before the camp in, in any of these cases, probably the ideal is that you don't go into this thing, not fit. And that's what we call a, you know, your survival camp. You're not thriving. You're, you're going to survive. You're not going to thrive. So what we want to do is come in so that we can absorb the fitness, which means that when you go on the camp, the camp's load, whether, we, you know, let's just call it the hours of the camp are, are not so much greater than your usual that you are going to risk injury, illness, burnout, you know, saddle sores that never heal, knee, you know, whatever. So anything can happen. And the chance of all those things increases when, when the difference, the acute chronic ratio, the um, it's too much too soon. Right. So I, I usually, no one knows where the line is and the line is different for every person. And it's going to be different year to year when it too much is too soon. Like what is too much? Right. It's hard to say, right. You know, what's your history? How injury prone are you? How stressed are you? Have you been eating? Have you been sleeping? Uh, there, there's all these factors that go into injury and illness. Uh, we know that, right. So I, I think the best thing you can do, you know, if you're looking for a line, it, it's probably around 50%. So if this week's going to end up being a 20 hour week, you're gone for say six days of riding, let's say five days of riding, and you're going to travel on a day, you're going to travel on a day on the other end, five days in the middle. It's a pretty tight camp, but it's, you, you got a week, you know, and you got to be back for the Monday or whatever it is for work. So in that case, maybe you're going to do uh, bold would be probably like a 20 hour. You're just going to go, what is that? Four hours a day for five days. Probably you wouldn't yeah. do that. Probably it'd be maybe it'd be like a three and then a four and then a five and then a four, something like that. But let's call it four every day for five days. So well, then I would say that a good target would be at least 10 hours of biking. Uh, so this could be on the trainer or outdoors or a bit of both is probably a good way to do it uh, in the weeks before. Now, a lot of people like to take a rest week before. I, I'm always medium on that. Sometimes I like to have a little bit of training the week before, and then they go to it, and then it's either a two-week or or maybe we even train a bit afterwards, depending on what the camp was like. Uh, it could be the last week of a block, too. So you could do a three-week block even, you know, a week, you know, so you could go like a 10 and then a 12, and then you leave and you do a 18-hour week or a 20-hour week. Well, it's funny. I think most people hear that and they're like, but I want to be fresh for the camp. But I actually think you're going to be the freshest coming off of a couple of like decent weeks versus coming off of a rest week where, you know, you always kind of have that like groggy, like start of the week. Yeah. Staleness, right? You mm -hmm. go very sharper, you stale, right? And that's where they, they have to balance this acute chronic ratio. Because if you just took an entire week and didn't do anything, right, then you're going to be stale. Is yeah. You're not going to be familiar with the bike. Um, but again, it really depends what your goal is. If your goal, if this camp is a race, you know, it's an event for your year, it's a tour that you really want to go and do and perform at, then this is a different conversation than if it's a training camp, right? Which I mean, can even be like the training camp with your club. Like if you really want to peak for that and, you know, feel really good on it to be beating people up to so the you top wanna, of the You want to know yourself, right? Like, and what is the objective with this camp? Is this the, like, one of the big things, you know, and then can we take recovery after this? Or, or are you, like, a lot of people where you're coming back and you actually want to perform in the spring classics or mm -hmm. um, the one big spring classic or whatever it is you're coming back to? It, it's sort of annoying. And can you do both? Probably a little bit. But again, it gets to that, what are, are we trying to perform and race and race and race? Or are you trying to develop, you know, a base of fitness which doesn't happen like by taking a bunch of weeks off and then crushing yourself and then taking another bunch of weeks off because you crushed yourself. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's what we mean by a survival camp, right? You survived the camp goal achieved, but what was the cost on right. either, either end of that? Yeah. Um, I also think uh, outside of the actual biking, you can do at the camp. A couple of things I'm thinking about is first uh, training camps can either be pretty healthy or they can be just like, 
ridiculous in terms of the the food and the alcohol that ends up on them, especially if you're there with your friends. So just being like very cautious about, you know, how much you're drinking, what you're eating, not to say you shouldn't have pizza, you should definitely have pizza. Uh, but maybe we have like one glass of wine, not a bottle. Mm -hmm. um, it's very easy to, I think, get into those like more unhealthy uh, modes of being when we're at these camps, especially if we're with friends. Mm -hmm. Uh, so that's kind of my first thing. Second thing is that this is actually a really good chance for you to catch up on sleep as well. Uh, you know, definitely not saying you should be the party pooper who like goes to bed at nine when everyone else is staying up and having fun. Mm -hmm. uh, but maybe this is a good chance for you to actually get that sleep. It's also going to help you recover more for these big days that your body may not be totally used to. Um, and last, last kind of lifestyle thing would be, uh, just making sure that you're doing any of the mobility exercises, a PT or a kinesiologist has given you and, or just doing, you know, some little yoga flows, just kind of getting some of that stiffness out between the getting to the place and, you know, kind of this added biking, you're probably going to be feeling a little stiff. So a little bit of foam rolling, a little bit of yoga flowing. Sure. Yeah, whatever you're into. And definitely that travel, you know, if it's a long drive or it's a big day of, of you know, planes, trains and automobiles, certainly you can see that where the back pain gets a little, you know, mm -hmm. it's a little groggy. So it's certainly opening up, starting with a walk, you know, not not really judging yourself on that first day. I always like to put, you know, this like take it easy around travel day, you know, on either side of the travel. That's about a 45 minute spin, you know, maybe 90, you know, where you just go to maybe go find the lo local coffee shop. You make sure your bike got together and you just don't really judge yourself or go out on any super big thing. And if we have the time, again, if it's a short camp where it's like, I only have four or five days, then it, it's tough to give up, you know, a day or two with something like that. But I would um, just argue you could do a short spin in the morning. And if everything feels good, come home, have lunch, and then do another ride in the afternoon if all systems are go, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. We often think every ride, kind of to your point, you're like, okay, day one's a four hour, day two is a five hour, day three is a seven hour, right. 18 hour, yeah. uh, whatever. But could it be a, you know, could it be one hour in the morning? And then if everything's feeling good, then you do two hours more in the afternoon. Sure. I mean, you have all days, so you could probably do even more. Uh, but yeah, that, that would be a great idea, you know, sort of do a shakeout for your body and your bike and, you know, maybe make a couple of tweaks and just make sure that, you know, everything's, you know, bolts are, are tight. And, and then, yeah, maybe you go and do a three hour in the afternoon, right? You leave at one and you're back at four. It's really not that big of a deal. Yeah. I think we just have it in our heads that these training camps, it's one long ride a day. And Which that... is a very cycling thing, right? It is. You know, yeah. Runners would not even, you know, for sure we'd do two runs in a day. Yeah, obviously. Uh, or swimmers or anything like that. So uh, that's, that's a great point. Uh, so now again, the other thing that comes up is, so there's, if you have a schedule for the camp, whether that's your, your, on a tour or you're with friends and the friends are just designing the routes, you're sort of in it. There's not a ton of choice. And, and I think that's an okay. It probably doesn't matter that much as long as you're ready for the challenge. So it's good to know in advance what the, the camp is that you're preparing for. Uh, you know, some people, the friends are going with aren't as fit. So it's a little slower or a little shorter, and then they'll add a bit to it. That's probably the best scenario in some ways, because you don't get into this like suffer fest and then you're blown really from the intensity, you know, and, and getting dragged way past the point of beneficial training, right? We're thriving training. What do you think about the, I'm, I'm, I hate the last day phrase, because I feel like I'm just jinxing anyone who's listening to this. But like, I feel like every training camp, there's always the holy crap day. Mm -hmm. It's either the second to last day or the last day where it's just the killer, just kick the crap out of ourselves, 18 hour ride. Mm -hmm. Can people do that? I mean, I'm sort of of two minds because honestly, like having done those, it's fun, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah, sure. I, I try and encourage not doing it on the last day. I, I think you can have a queen stage. You can have a, a big day, a big exploration, and you're gone a lot of the day for sure. We have to recognize that for most adults, this is fun. This is like their vacation. Um, again, we're speaking to this as if you're training for something. So we do need to keep remembering like, well, what, what is the question you're asking me? Like, do you just want to drink a lot of beer or you know, what, what is the goal here? But I, I think there's a balance there between training, you know, quote unquote, seriously, and then also going for adventure rides, which probably are beneficial, you know, especially if you're doing something like Unbound or any of these things that are sort of a wild adventure. <laughs> you don't know what's coming there. Take all day. So I, I don't think there's a problem. With it. I would say do it on the second last day, third last day, if it's a longer trip, 
you know, somewhere in there. And then the last day, just let it be smooth and be done by around, you know, midday, bike clean, bike cleaned up, and then go, you know, go for a, a hike or go for something else where your bike isn't going to get destroyed. You're not going to get stranded. You're not going to crash really badly because we've seen it too often where it's like you spend the last day and night in the hospital and everyone's sick and injured and lost. And, you know, it's super stressful. Maybe you get a present for your partner who's not along on the camp, there especially you. if we, he or she uh, is taking care of the kids while you're gone. Just putting that out there. And so what we've done in the past, you know, and it's sort of, you know, pick the piece of your favorite ride. You know, we've ridden, you know, I've met you somewhere, you know, you do the one mountain climb I really liked and do a good hard interval to finish it. But then like, you know, safe descending home. And then we meet, you know, for lunch or something and we walk around the place wherever we are, make it a good day. But yeah, I, I would save the, like the kick the crap out of yourself for the second last day. If you're going to do something like that. Yes, absolutely. And just, you know, getting ready for the airport and stuff again, like give yourself the afternoon and, and yeah. to do that and relax. And again, if it's here, if we're trying to have a vacation where we're relaxed, we're enjoying it. Like it, we probably don't need to be out on the bike all day. Yeah. Uh, and I think last thing is just uh, remembering right now, really bad cold and flu season this year. So definitely leading up to the camp, you don't want to get sick during the camp. You don't want to get sick. So all of the usual, you know, take care of yourself, wash your hands. You know, if you're a high risk person, maybe wear a mask in airports and on planes, especially if you don't like, honestly, I'm just saying like, if you don't want to get sick at the camp, wear a mask on the plane. Sure. Like it's probably the smartest thing you can do. Well, like, I think this gets to, you know, we train consistently, we sleep really well all leading into it. I usually say, you know, don't touch your face, wash your hands. The mask can certainly help with not touching your face as much. Um, but that's, that's the idea is you just wash your hands. Don't touch your face try and not get stressed in the airport. And then on the camp, again, this is where the survival thing gets a little dicey for me because it is how often you get sick, either, you know, you're living with people or at the airport on the way home, immune systems, you know, in trouble or, or the immune system is knocked down from the amount of volume. Mm -hmm. And then again, how long till we get back to training when we're home? And that's, that's the thing that always, you know, I love training camps. I think they're very important. They're good, but then that's always the, the, Thing where we compare this to the person who stayed at home and did 10 12 exactly. hours and then they took the week off work stayed at home staycation did 15 hours at home a little bit of trainer you know whatever uh and then you know how are these two people you know if we could race these two people you know it's two versions of yourself who would come out in the end for sure yeah. it's not really a great comparison because you know you're you either go on vacation or you don't i guess you either can or you don't you don't i don't know how you come out with this but that's the idea. So I, I think that's probably the main things around training camps. I think the only other thing question I, I, I think we haven't covered is the like, do you do intervals on the camp? Oh, I, th I think this depends a lot on, on what you're doing, right? If you're really pushing the volume and, and you're doing big mountain climbs, I think that's built into it. That's why a lot of the times when people tell me they're going away, even if the, it's, you know, them and their spouse or, you know, short of it being just you on your own. I probably wouldn't, I would just say, you know, here's a little bit of guard, guardrails, maybe depending on the person, three to five hours, you know, try and take a day off every two, three, four days. Um, you know, again, around the, the travel, some of that stuff. But if you were there solo, you know, you, you really do have all day to yourself, especially as the, if the camp starts getting seven, you know, over seven days, 10 days, two weeks, you know, some of these people can leave for a longer time. I think that's where you have to go back to more normal training where we would, Today is a hilly interval ride, you know, tomorrow is a flat, longer day, you know, you're taking a day off, you know, on the appropriate days. Uh, I think that's probably where we want to be a little more. So if it's a, if it's a shorter camp or, or it's sort of just ride, you know, as you like, but when it gets longer uh, or, or if you're on your own, you know, maybe there's a little bit of, of structure to be put in there. I think especially also if you're on a camp where it's very flat, right? Like we spent a chunk of time last year in Florida where it was incredibly flat. So I think there you actually almost have to vary your intensity a little bit just because otherwise it's there's just no change versus if you're in a hillier area, then your intensity is just going to kind of naturally ebb and flow. Just you got there's most people don't have the the fitness, I think, to to not be doing some sort of intervals, call it sweet spot when you climb a mountain, right? Like it's just exactly. it's gonna take 200 watts or whatever it's gonna take. And that's you know, for most people, they're working pretty hard. Um, if you add other people into it, there's gonna be moments where it's harder than you want it to be. We'll call it an interval and, and enjoy it. 
Yeah, and in, in Florida, I think you got to sort of press the lap button and, and do some sort of interval, uh, which might be driven by the group you're with, right? Again, if you're with people, that's one thing. But if, when we were solo, yeah, you sort of need to say, you know, I'm going to do strides for you. You're going to do these 30 second pickups. Um, then for me, it was sort of I did a bit of off road time trials um, and a little bit of work. Just they had like a uh, bike path, and so I would just do a bit of intervals on the bike path for sure. But there was no. You're right. It's it's hard in Florida to do the the uh climbs. I would just throw the dog in the doggy jogger and do some resistance running. That was great too. Sure. sure. <laughs> All right. If you have any other questions, we'd love to hear from you. Hit us up. We have a contact form over at consummateathlete.com. You can find us on Instagram at consummateathlete and hit us with questions there or me over at, at Molly J. Herford. Peter is at Peter Glassford. And we will be back next week with another episode. Thanks so much for tuning in. Thanks so much for tuning in to the Consummate Athlete Podcast. If you want to hear more training, racing, and endurance sport advice, make sure you subscribe to the podcast and leave us a rating and review. You can also subscribe to our newsletter at consummateathlete.com for a weekly dose of inspiration and advice straight to your inbox.